Hello there, and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More. So today I am very pleased to uh, present to you my guest, Jennifer Hamady. Welcome. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Yeah, this is very cool. I'm uh, very excited to talk to a, a pro singer and a uh, vocal coach. I don't know that I've had the privilege to talk to too many vocal coaches in my day, so, so this will be maybe a first. Oh, great, great. And I apologize, everyone, for this. There's a storm here, so if the lights flicker, that's why. <laughs> yeah, this is this is technology. And uh, at least, uh, you know, we're not going to get wet. We right. could be outside doing this somewhere. <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, all right. Well, um, I think the interview in the cloud provided our connection uh, is stable between the two of us, then it yeah. should, you know, we should have something that is listenable and enjoyable. But I see that actually, as I'm listening to a lot of people posting stuff, interviews on Instagram live streams, you know, these uh, tech problems pop up in the middle of interviews and they still post them because this is life and you just, you know, just mm -hmm. roll with it, you Absolutely. know. So, um, so uh, you and I never officially met in person or even uh, really before this, but uh, we did have a lot of uh, back and forth through email and texting and stuff uh, through Facebook. So um, I understand you were part of the Book Doula book program, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, I had a wonderful experience doing that. And I wonder what your experience was like. Well, it, it was really great. A friend of mine, Karen Salmonson, uh, recommended this as you know, wonderful uh, program for people working on books and I'm working on my fourth. So it was just a chance instead of doing it as I always do kind of an isolation to have a community around me, um, as you know, and maybe your listeners do, you know, with a weekly check-in and some support. Um, and again, that community was really priceless for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so you had books uh, as early as two, wait, 2016 was one, right? That's the latest. That was yeah. the latest. Okay, wow. So, and the other one was 2011 or something around there? First one was 2009. Is when Nine, it was. yeah, that was, was in my head. Wow. Yeah. No, 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 it's, it's amazing, which of course to me feels like yesterday, but I think, wait a minute, that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, oh man, 2009. Uh, I met my wife in 2009 and uh, went really? to Brazil. Yeah, oh man, there was a whole lot of growing that I had. I joined... Uh, the SGI, I started practicing Buddhism in 2009. And for me, it seems like I've been practicing for so long. So oh, amazing. Yeah. So you started a new journey at that time too, right? As an author. Absolutely. Yeah. And what's not, I'd love to hear more about Buddhism. I, I, uh, I've been a long sort of fan from the sidelines and read Lion's Roar in some of the magazines, but I, I'm such an admirer of that and the Taoist way, uh, just, just love it. So. Oh, wow. Fascinating. I'm sure we'll get to the philosophy portion. <laughs> of this yeah so we have a few people watching uh, welcome uh everyone who's watching and for those of you watching on the replay thanks for being here feel free to you know send some questions or comments uh hello marcy magrino and darlene carney so let me jump in and ask you can you remember what it was that got you into enjoying music in the first place what are some of your earliest inspirations mm -hmm. Well, I, I have sung for as long as I can remember. It wasn't, it wasn't even a conscious thing. I, my, my parents tell me from the time, from before I can remember, I was always singing. Um, and I don't come from a particularly musical family. It was just something I always did and loved to do. Um, and it, it's always been a real blessing. So the singing, the loving of music, sort of the playfulness and discovery has just been with me since I was a child. And I've been lucky to make a career out of it. So you know, mm -hmm. just very lucky. Wow. So was there like, uh, kind of interesting that your family isn't particularly musical, but they obviously must have supported you to uh, have made a career out of it. Yeah, well, they were very encouraging. I mean, I think, um, I think of, at times there was some practical, you know, nudges, are you sure you don't want to go to law school kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. but no, by and large, it was do what you love, you're smart, if it doesn't work out, you can do something else. Um, and that unconditional support was really obviously a gift um, because it never occurred to me that I couldn't do it or 
that it was wrong to do it. It was just something I loved and, and, and followed that just step by step by step. Hmm. Wow. So did you have like, uh, I don't know, did you love Madonna? Did you love Donna Summer? I, I don't know what kind of, because yeah. you're a singer, right? So I, I don't know what inspires a singer or, or a female singer. I'm not 100% sure what style you favor the most. So who were like some of those early inspirations? Well, it's funny. I, I literally would listen to whatever was on the radio back then mm -hmm. when people listened to the radio before there was <laughs> streaming. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the first concert I went to was a Kenny Rogers concert because it's what my mother took me to. And then I went to a Bon Jovi concert, you know, so it was less about um, singers, I think, that I loved. And it, as I remember it in my early years and more um, that I just loved anything that was on the radio, I would sing to, I would work out the harmonies, I'd make up new harmonies. It was more sort of a love affair with the, just the experience of the song and imitating the way they sang. But um, no, I definitely was into sort of pop music. Um, as I got older for a while, I lived in Nashville. I had a home in Nashville and I got a little more into country music and folk and the storytelling of it. Um, but I think it's Irving Berlin, isn't it? That said, never hate anything that, that sells a million copies. And I've always, <laughs> I think there's something to be learned from any style of music. Uh, my husband loves like metal, like hard rock kind of stuff, which I never did, but now I'm obsessed with it. And I, I find, you know, the joy in that. So um, yeah, I, I really listen to any and everything. There's, there's very little I will turn off. Mm -hmm. Well, so it wasn't particularly like, uh, oh, I want to be like so-and-so when you were younger. It was more of just in genuine, general joy for singing, kind of. Totally. But yeah, I mean, I wanted to, yeah, I don't know that I thought about it. Yes. I mean, I think at the time there was like Ryan Perry was very big, Whitney Houston. And so but I don't know that I ever thought I want to be them or like them. I think I wanted to be me. And I just loved the, just the experience of singing, less the sound of it, if that makes sense. I mean, I love the sound and sounding good and, and filling a room, but mm. there was something always has been very intimate for me of the process of, of singing um, that I think is, has been my biggest, if not my primary motivator. That, that makes a lot of sense to me because uh, I don't have that. And uh, I am a singer, but uh, I was never motivated to really like be a singer maybe because I didn't, I don't actually love the process of singing that much. I can sing, you know, I, I admire so many singers. I want to be like them when I was younger, but singing hurts me. <laughs> so I don't like to uh, sing for too long. When I, I mean, I have had my time of doing two hour gigs. I'm, I'm always also playing guitar always and sometimes leading a group. So there's a lot of responsibilities. I never just focus hundred percent on singing. Yeah. So it was never this, uh, yeah, the process of it was never that, that enjoyable for me. Interesting. <laughs> but yeah. I like, I love singing as well. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but not like, uh, it was more, I don't know. It seemed more external for me compared to what your experience, you know, yeah, but maybe you had this, a similar relationship with your guitar, which is the primary instrument, right? Yeah. Right. That, that I just physically, it feels just like part of me coming out. Yeah. yeah, so it is very true that I am more of a guitarist than anything else. Yeah. Um, but singing is pretty close, you know, pretty close behind that, you know. Yeah. And composing for me. I'm a guitarist, singer, composer. I play other instruments, but those are my main things. Well, sometime let's talk about the tension thing, because that's some that's an area I'm passionate about, and write about and coach around. So maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> some of that discomfort that breaks my heart to hear, because it doesn't have to be there. So. Right. Yeah, well, that that's the thing. I, I like I said, I've never really talked to a vocal coach. So, I had I had one guy in high school who gave me some tips, but it was more about uh, projecting because I, I was into I was singing the heavy metal band in high school, so mm -hmm. it was more about like shooting my voice across the room, mm -hmm. and you know then I work with singers and bands who took vocal lessons and they would coach me on how to like breathe properly and take care of your voice, but it just never mattered enough to me to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm more like I'm more folk singer so yeah. I just sing just grab the guitar and sing you know perfect um so how would you describe well you kind of have maybe but if there's anything to add how would you describe the overall influence music has had in your life 
Well, you know, I, I, I can't say it enough and I'll probably sound cheesy trying to say it, but um, it really is music and singing in particular, but music too has, has really been sort of the, the through theme love affair of my life. It's the, and perhaps because it's in the body, I don't know. I, I'm also, I also play some piano, but I'm not great. But for me, singing is, it's like having your best friend in your body, you know, this mm -hmm. it's kind of always there for you. Um, yeah, it's, it's just like this beautiful, precious, intimate relationship with this um, entity, this life and lifeline that's always with you and never um, going to leave. It's a lifelong relationship. And so um, to answer your try to answer your question more directly and less uh, sort of esoterically. No, I mean, I, I think, well, let me answer it this way. There have been very few times in my life that for whatever reason I've been distracted or, or um, something's come up that I'm not singing often or not focusing on music. And I really notice it. I mean, I just get mm -hmm. down and, and I'll look around my life and myself and go, what's going on? And it takes me a minute to go, oh, wait, music's missing, singing. Mm -hmm. And immediately it's back. There's something about maybe people that do yoga or meditate have this, but something about the engagement of the breath and the body and the, the vibration that just literally has life pulsing inside of you that just brings me to life. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, there's a few different places I, I, I could go with that, but um, in response, it definitely inspired me in me the memory or the because I, I I practice Nichiren Buddhism, which is a which is a chanting Buddhism. It's not meditation. It's we we it's a meditation through chanting. But so every single day, I'm toning. You know, so it's a lot of breath work. It's very rhythmical. It's directed, and that vibration when I first heard it. Uh, I don't know if it was the very first time, but early on in my experience, I, I started crying because it just felt so like I was in my grandma's house again, you know, like yeah. that warm feeling of being home. And I discovered it when I was late twenties, you know, mm -hmm. but so, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I totally feel that. And I, I'm pretty good with breath work because I, I take it seriously. I have for years. Uh, yeah, but I still haven't <laughs> translated that to making singing pain-free you know maybe i just choose the wrong keys i don't know but yeah. um <laughs> definitely can i i mean I'd, I'd love i would be honored to help try to support you in that but go ahead <laughs> turn it into all that if, if i'm not yeah kidding. no i know it keep, keeps coming back to that because it, it's funny because i like there was a pivotal point in my career where i said you know i don't want to pers pursue my own john henry sheridan band because I, I was for a while uh, let me just go with this other band where someone else is going to sing and is more democratic Mm -hmm. instead of me being the leader that was a big part of it but i also just physically didn't want to sing over and over again you know yeah but i was also singing very personal songs too and i didn't want to go that route like i can imagine billy joel or someone singing the the love song for the 15,000th time it just drives mm -hmm. you nuts after a while if it was actually your life you know that you're singing about mm -hmm. yeah i get that i get that if it's some, if it's a song someone else wrote, and you're just singing it, and you kind of like embodying it for that moment. That's a little bit different, I guess. But um, anyway, this is I'm getting a little off into into my own interview here. So. Oh, I love it. It's very interesting to me, and I'm sure everyone else. So please, take, wherever organically this takes us, I'm happy with. So. Thanks. Um, so yeah, this next question, I definitely am very. I have a curiosity point. So I understand you began your career as a performer singing and touring which is awesome uh with some impressive and incredible musical acts so can you tell us a little bit about those early days of your career and what was it like what you gain for the experience what you like about it what was challenging mm -hmm. well, you know they say that um you know they call it like an overnight sensation that expression and i, th I think probably like a lot of people in our business and maybe many others i worked for a long time recording doing demos everything for years and years and years and years and getting i mean i could pay the bills but not really breaking through and then after i don't remember eight eight or so years i just met the right people and then it was like welcome and then i started singing back up for all kinds of really amazing um acts Stevie Wonder, Patti LaBelle, Christina Aguilera, um, Def Leppard, some people sort of in that cat in that 
category or echelon. And then from there, it just it kind of just happened, you know, once you get a name. Um, and then I would do spot dates with people or sing on the Grammys, do some touring. Um, and I think the second part of your question is what did I learn from that? Well, first it was amazing, of course. It was really just extraordinary. And <laughs> for a number of reasons and I could go on and on, but of course the experience, you know, just to be around such talented people and, and, you know, alive and in this experience of, of being at the top of my game, the game I wanted to play. Um, and also the sense of pride and accomplishment for, for having not given up, you know, for having really pushed because as, as we all know, when you're paying your dues, uh, certainly in music, um, there's no guarantee you're going to get anywhere. It's not like one plus one equals two. So no. there was a there's a great sense of pride and satisfaction from going. Wow, I'm really proud that I, you know, I committed to this and I didn't give up. Um, and and then I I mean I learned so many things. You know, um, just discipline. I, one of my big tours was with uh, was as a lead singer with Cirque du Soleil, one of their shows, and um, you know just day after day, tour bus, planes, hotels, um, the relationships, you know, just the, the physical discipline. I, I really enjoy touring. I, I loved it. And I love traveling in general. But, you know, you just you, you discover dimensions of your about things about yourself and dimensions within yourself. Um, when you don't, when you can't go back home at the end of the night and turn off. I mean, you're literally mm -hmm. with 24 seven for years. Um, so it's just an opportunity to sort of meet yourself in this new place and way and either rise to the occasion or not and in either in either event learn from it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I would those that time of my life, those experiences, I mean, just invaluable. I could literally spend a whole episode, I'm sure, talking just about, you know, the people I met and the experiences and the highs and the lows and uh, just amazing. Everything you might imagine it. I loved it. Yeah. Wow. Um I'm, I'm glad to hear you love it because uh, for me, uh, it's another kind of like different uh, difference in uh, perspective or whatever it is. I don't know. But for me, I only had a tiny bit of taste of touring. I did a lot of traveling. So I can imagine, imagine if I was with a band or an act or whatever. But I, I was never really in a position of being a hired gun for too much. It was more like group things that we built together. So we're kind of on our own. Yeah. So I don't really know what it's like to uh, be in a web of a, a bunch of really talented people that's where there's a lot of like managerial stuff being taken care of professionally. <laughs> I don't yeah. really know what that's like, you know, and be supportive with that. Yeah. But I imagine it's, that must be thrilling. And especially if there's some sort of healthy work ethic and you get, you get a sense that like the people you're with are not going to go off the deep end and they're not going <laughs> to start fights or, uh, you know, you know, have, have money arguments and stuff like that. If you can yeah. kind of trust that, then. It was, well, it's interesting because, I mean, I think that we, tours like you're talking about, that can, they can be really um, wonderful at the low end if the relationships flow. And then I've, I met people on some of my higher end tours that we had every opportunity and every sort of creature comfort and they were miserable. So, but of course, um, you know, we had, you know, like a masseuse before every show and catering, mm -hmm. you know, stayed in like the best hotels and, you know, it was wonderful. And I've, I've always been a morning person. So I was sort of very unusual in the sense that right after the shows, I'd go to bed. I mean, I'd once mm -hmm. in a while we'd go out for drink and, but I was always early to bed because at 8am I'd be up and touring whatever city or whatever, when whatever country nice. you're in. Uh -huh. you don't have to be to the gig until five or four for sound checks so i you know I, I loved it but absolutely to your to your point i think that um you know when small bands and i work with some some of them that are starting out and they're renting a van and there are money problems and they don't know where they're staying or this person's gone nuts or this one's girlfriend is giving a hard time and this person's got mm -hmm. like a lot of, yeah i mean i can't even imagine having to cope with all of that and the logistics too to your point on top of trying to you know do a great job that you know, in my early days, I remember some of that, but no, I mean, yeah. <laughs> fortunately, toward the end of my mainly performing career, I was very lucky to, to just be able to enjoy the ride and just, just sing, perform. Yeah, that, that's so awesome. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I would imagine that if, if you, if I was in a situation where I did feel like, okay, now it's my chance to just 
now if I do my best, everything's going to be okay. You know, if I can just like get into that mindset, totally. I would probably be similar. I would get up early. I would go to bed early and uh, just kind of take care of myself. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, it's, it's fun to hear, you know, the story. So I do have to ask Def Leppard, one of my favorite bands of all time. <laughs> what were they like? Were, were they pretty cool guys? So, I mean, I mean, I'm not just saying this, they, so I, I sang with them. Um, I started with them. Was it 2006? I'm very, not great with years, but it was, it was when they did the VH1 rock honors. Mm -hmm. and so, and I was with them for a while for some different dates and did some touring and they, honest to God, I'm not making this. They were just the nicest, most humble, down to earth, kind people. And some of them had their wives come with us on the plane and, you know, um, just super grounded, loved music, loved the, you know, loved their relationships. And that's been, and by the way, my husband is obsessed with them too. And so he, when we first <laughs> was like, you sang with who? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in my, in my experience, this is a general generalization, but most, not all, most of the people I met kind of at the top of their game were all super kind. I mean, you sort of meet not nice characters in the middle, but somehow you kind mm -hmm. of get to a certain point where I did. And it just, maybe it's, I don't know if it's just, you get that high up and you get a different perspective and it just, the humility sinks in, or maybe, you know, being kind is sort of an unspoken prerequisite to just keep those relationships um, mm -hmm. and kindness uh, going. So people want to work with you and to continue to promote you. I don't know the chicken and the egg of it, but right. yeah most of the people at the, not all but most of the people up there that i worked with or, or were, was around um were just great really really surprisingly just lovely mm -hmm. yeah that's good to hear yeah I, I did get the feeling for you know throughout my life that uh def leopard was somehow like a true brotherhood you know true group of yeah. decent guys you know that of course have their differences but like i always felt joe uh, elliott didn't really uh, take over as like the lead singer. Like it really felt very, I don't really like the word democratic, but very equal kind of democratic in that way yeah. that they were all could equally speak for the band almost, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I'm glad to hear that from your experience. That you know, sounds true. Yeah. I do want to say just, just to, to, to be clear that, and this was true of all of my backup gigs. I mean, of course, sometimes you'd get to know All right, guys. So if you're still watching, um, seems like I might have lost my connection with uh, with Jennifer. I imagine she might sign off and sign back on. We'll see. Uh, she did have um, thunderstorm uh, in her area, so it's possible that uh, she lost power. So just uh, hang in there. And in the meantime, I will uh, ask you, uh, which, what is your favorite Def Leppard, Def Leppard album, if you like Def Leppard? Uh, my favorite, hands down, is Hysteria. One of the, I think one of the best rock albums of all time. And uh, uh, Pyromania is an amazing album. And so is um, Adrenalize, I like a lot. Uh, there are some other ones. If you like Def Leppard, I'm curious to know what are your favorites. Of course, any other question you may have uh, for our interview, please let me know. I have a feeling Jennifer is gonna try to sign back on any minute um, as soon as she gets a, a um, yeah, all right. So she's saying that the storm has knocked her out. I'm going to just tell her, no problem. Sign on whenever you can. I'll hold down the fort. Here she is. Okay, cool. All righty. So, um, yeah, I just let her in. I'm hoping the, 
her connection will become stable again. <clears throat> All right, admitting into the room. All right, Jennifer, can you hear me? I can. I'm so okay. sorry. It's like a live gig, like we said. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we'll just, fortunately, we're both pretty uh, flexible and can roll with the punches. So yeah. I just was talking to the audience and asking them uh, their favorite Def Leppard album. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know. I didn't get any answers. Maybe I don't have too many Def Leppard fans in the house at the moment, but uh, <laughs> maybe on the replay, we'll get a bunch. Uh, well, I'll just tell you real quick. So but it's funny because that love of Def Leppard has gone down. My, step, my son, who's almost eight, like pour some sugar on me is like on constantly. And he'll look at me like, did you really sing this, mommy? And I'll have to bring up the video of me, <laughs> the boots and the big hair. And he's like, wow. <laughs> so, wow. so yeah, but no, so many great songs, such a great band. Um, and just, as I was saying, just wonderful people, wonderful, wonderful people. Yeah, good to know. Yeah, I, and just on one more Def Leppard point, like I do regard Hysteria, the, their, I think, 87 album, as one of the best rock albums, uh, soft rock albums, maybe, of, of all time. Just so well done, so Thanks. tasty. I'm with you. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, and you said Stevie Wonder too? Mm -hmm. I imagine, you know, I imagine he was pretty cool. I, I really don't know him, but the vibe I get from him is always yeah. pretty peaceful. Yeah. And, and, you know, he, he was at least in the, I only sang with him, I think three or four times at what we call spot gigs, where I think we did the, um, the world music awards and some different kind of shows like that in LA. And he was always surrounded by, you know, his team or his handlers. And, um, so you never, I never got to really know him, but no, I mean, the man's a legend. So just being around him was on <laughs> you know, kind, gracious. I mean, again, mm -hmm all of them literally that I sang with without exception is just where they were all just wonderful. Um, but yeah, I mean, the man's a genius. So just being like near him on stage was sort of like, ah, you know? yeah, I, I can imagine. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't put this in the question uh, that I, that I sent to you ahead of time, but if, if there's anything you could say in terms of what, made you decide to to no longer be a performing singer yeah and you so. can ask me anything yeah okay. I've got mm -hmm. questions but no no please feel free to ask me anything so that's an interesting question and again you know i feel like i was very lucky with the timing i was in my mid-30s on a tour and i'll, I'll never forget it i woke up in, in some hotel room in some city and i kind of thought i was i think i was 35 and i was like you yeah. know I could probably be exactly in the same place at 45. And not that that's a bad thing. I was loving it. But mm -hmm. and at the time, I'd, I don't think I really was like, I want a family or anything, but I just thought, no, you know, I think I'm okay. I think I've, I think I've had this experience. I want something else. And at the time, my first book, um, I had already written it because I was giving master classes when I was touring and, and just people were asking me, how do you sing that way? And it sort of organically turned into, um, giving master classes and then a book, all these, the same emails over and over again, just turned into a book. And then, so that started to take on a momentum of its own. And then I just sort of naturally shifted into writing about singing and the psychology of singing and um, self-expression. And then just sort of shifted into a practice. That was my last tour. I came home, met my husband, you know, interestingly six months later, and that was that. Had a oh, job, wow. you know, and now, um, but feel really fulfilled. I'll just say one more thing and interrupt me if I'm going on and on. But we, I have a lot of friends in the music business who, who, well, in life, who have a lot of regret. And whether it's because they didn't get as far as they wanted to go, um, and they they left and they regret maybe not trying more, or people that had families and regret that they didn't have the time. Um, and so I feel very lucky that for whatever reason. Um, just the timing of it worked that I was really ready for a new phase when, uh, and that I was able to step pretty gracefully into a new phase that, that inspired me and inspires me just as much, honestly, as singing. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I, I believe it. True. I think a, a unique, um, gift. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I imagine, uh, because you weren't a central act that had a lot of, um, uh, machinery around you, was it, was it pretty, seamless you probably didn't have to break too many 
I don't know, ruffle too many feathers to, to say I'm going to stop singing or, or, or what? You're, you're totally right. I mean, I, I finished out that contract. Um, and people would still call and say, you sure you don't want to do this? Are you sure you can't do that? And, and sometimes I would, especially if they were spot gigs or mm -hmm. um, one year I sang back up on American Idol um, for Hollywood Week, for example. I was like, okay, I can come out to LA you know, for a week. Why not? Mm -hmm. uh, but no, no feather, no feathers being ruffled at all. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's for better or worse. That's part of it. Like you're, you're unique. We're all unique, but we're all replaceable. And I don't mean mm -hmm. that in a pejorative sense. I mean, it's from a, from a very, in a very humbling way, it's, it's wonderful to realize that who we are, you know, I love what I do. Uh, I love singing. I love being a singer. I'm proud of the work that I did, but it's not, who I am so um so that that transition also is easier for me than maybe some some friends of mine and colleagues who um this is true for athletes I know where they 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 are you know their career and so who are they without it kind of thing mm -hmm. no I I feel like I had an easy go of that too wow yeah sounds like quite a quite a path you've, you've led for sure um yeah, you, so you, your story reminds me a little bit about mine uh, in uh, a lot of ways, uh, but this, so you said at 35, you're just like, okay, I think I've got what I needed from this experience. Let's go somewhere new. Let's grow, you know. Uh, for me, <clears throat> um, yeah, my, my final hurrah as uh, trying to like make it with the Rockstar Dream was around 2006, and I was 25. And, uh, and I was just like, I, I'd been doing it for over 10 years and, and just really just not getting any closer to a healthy and um, sustainable existence, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, that was a big part of it. You know, I'm like, you know, I don't want to, I was raised by my mother. Uh, my father died young and mm -hmm. I don't want to die out in the road or, or, you know, like get into some bad habits that's going to disappoint her. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I saw, and I saw it getting, too close too many times with drunk driving and whatever kind of silly stuff and almost signing a contract with band members who were basically hated each other <laughs> so glad we didn't do that you know Every, two of them really didn't like each other so being stuck in this sort of marriage with people who didn't get along that would have yeah. been awful it yeah. would have it was a management thing not a record deal but it was still yeah. anyway so I, I broke free from that and i just realized i can't imagine I haven't played in a band since then. I've played with a band, but not in a band. And uh, that was 2006. I've done a lot of music. I've released much more music since then than I did before. But a lot of it was archival stuff. Um, and uh, so my, my journey kind of this kind of more, uh, um, what's the word I want to use, but physical pleasure oriented success, material success, uh, seeking kind of, mm -hmm. I won't say it ended there, but in a way it did. And then I started this more spiritual journey and I sought what religion do I really want for myself? I was born Catholic, but it just wasn't quite sitting right with me, you know? So mm -hmm. I kept seeking mm -hmm. and I, I do respect it. And I love the church in its own way it has this mothering father feeling to me, but Mm -hmm. I kept seeking and I went various paths. I ended up in India, even uh, seeking Buddha, uh, seeking Hinduism. And I uh, went to Jewish, uh, uh, ceremony, you know, services and uh, Quaker service. I went to a Quaker retreat, you know, I just was seeking. And then it was finally Buddhism, this particular form. And there are other forms that I would looked into too, but this particular form that I just decided, let me just give it a go. But uh, so I came back from, came back from India, 2009. And then I, um, it was January, I came back. By March, I had broken up with my girlfriend for which was three plus years. Mm -hmm. And it was just this real sad thing that just happened naturally. There's mm -hmm. no anger. I mean, maybe she was angry at me, but it was just like, I don't think our paths are going together. And we, ha I just have to acknowledge that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said to uh, someone, I was doing student teaching and this teacher mm -hmm. said, yeah, give yourself six months before you meet someone else. Cause I, it wasn't that I didn't want a relationship. It just wasn't the right one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and I said, yeah, you know, in six months, I'm going to find someone. And that was 
Yeah, that was like April. And then uh, I, I met my wife in, in October, six months later. So ridiculous. I had no idea how it was going to happen, but I had just started chanting and I was visualizing it. And I was saying, I'm not going to be too picky. You know, I don't care what, how tall she is, how, you know, her, what she looks like, what language she speaks or doesn't speak. But uh, I mean, she has to speak English to some degree, but um, <laughs> communication is overrated, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. But so I was focusing on the vibe I would feel when I met her. Totally. No, that's beautiful. Good. You know, and when I met her, Yoko, her, is her, I'm Yoko and John, by the way. But, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and when I met her, I was like this, I'm getting the vibe with her that I was been praying about all this time. Could this be her, you know? Mm -hmm. And actually there a few months before I met her, I went to the rock and roll uh, museum annex in um, New York City. They had an annex there for a little bit. And there was a exhibit of Yoko Ono's, this white room dedicated to John Lennon. And it had their like a lot of their goofing around their videos, some of it political, some of it just weird. And yeah. I was like, man, I don't know, you know, John Lennon seems like he could have so many different women, but he picked Yoko Ono. He must really love her. You know, that was my feeling. So. Like, I want to find my Yoko, the one I could be that goofy with, that that natural with. Yeah. Whether other people think she's attractive or not, doesn't matter. You know, and then who knew that I would actually find my Yoko a couple months later. That's amazing. Isn't love wonderful? <laughs> yeah. Really, yeah, it's, yeah, that we could talk about that for hours too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and love in every sense. Definitely loving myself was the, the key to it all, right? Oh, for to, sure. To finding that, uh, hey... I'm okay. I'm worthy of love. And then the right person that I can grow with will, will, will appear. And there was a lot of faith involved. Yeah. You know? Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. It was just like your story, you know, resonated um, yeah. and in other ways too. But uh, so I want to ask you about the psychology portion. So, so you became a therapist. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So you write regularly for psychology today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was reading through some of the article titles and uh, I'm like, yep, yep. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I get it. This is something worth talking about, you know? And uh, it's all very, um, yeah, built around self-love and very practical. Uh, so, I'm, uh, and I will put that link in the show notes. So can you talk about what's your process when you write for psychology today, when you write an article? I mean, you could talk about therapy as well, Sure. But um, just in particular, the articles, I'm curious. Yeah. Well, just a, as a bit of background before the article part. So, yeah. So when I, um, after that tour and my first book came out, which is really, as I said, about the psychology of singing, because long story short, when I was working with singers on ostensibly on their singing, I noticed before I ever, ever thought about being a therapist that all these seemingly technical issues were not technical. They were mental. Uh, mm -hmm. this person can't hit this note or they're having these you know some self-sabotage stuff and I just noticed again and again that that so many issues were caused or exacerbated by this uh, emotional component that most of them were completely unaware of most people mm -hmm. so um as I moved full-time into working with singers and speakers and eventually um even professionals just on communication and self-expression speaking and singing um I started thinking, why not go back and just do a graduate degree in psychology, sort of just to give me an academic foundation to what I've been doing intuitively and writing about. So uh, now coming full circle to your, to your point, so I'd written, I think, two books by the time Psychology Today contacted me and said, we, we came across your book or your blog. I, I, don't, I think it was my blog. We really like what you do. Would you want to write for us? And so, of course, I said, yes, I think it's been about 10 years now that I've been writing for them. I have to double check that, but it's been a while. And I think you asked about the process. You know, for me, writing a book, writing books, which I really enjoy, it's one, it's one very unique and very different process than articles. For me, even if I might only write an article worth uh, in terms of length in a day in a book, you know, I'm, I'm deep in the pool of the book, right? So it's, whereas an article, I can have an idea and just kind of flit around the surface and, and it's, a, it's a different kind of creative feeling. So um, the process is I'll usually just get an idea and sort of draft it up just in the moment. I've learned over the years with articles 
as tempting as it can be, even if I think, oh, if this article is great, I'm going to publish it or submit it to the editor um, or in my, on my own website, just pu publish it. I've learned to wait a day or two because the next day you see things you, you don't see the first day, just mm -hmm. some distance and perspective. So I usually give it about a week um, and I'll just kind of come back and edit it, clean it up, go away, come back, edit it, clean it up, come back. And it can be 10 minutes. Um, and then I always know in my gut when it's ready, you know, mm -hmm. it's ready now, you know, and I'm not perfectionistic in that way because it's, it's never going to be perfect, but um, and that's, that's definitely a trap at the beginning I'd fall into because then I'd spend a month on an article, which is great, but then, <laughs> so I don't know if I, if I really answered your question, John, but yeah, so that's the process is, um, very rare. And I have a folder actually of ideas. So sometimes an idea will come to me and I'll sort of outline it or the points that are in my heart I want to make, but I just don't feel, I never force myself to write an article. Um, if it's not speaking to me, I literally have a folder of like a hundred of them now from over the years. And sometimes I'll think, oh, I really, what was that one article I was thinking of? And I'll pull it up and sometimes it'll be done in like 20 minutes because it's just mm -hmm. in my heart at that moment. Right, right. Um, and then one other thought, yeah, but my intention, that's the process. My intention with articles, um, you know, where the, where the books have obviously like the main theme I'm working on, whether it's the psychology of singing or the latest one was, uh, the technology and relationships on stage and in the studio with articles it's for me it's really all about they're they're like little mini love songs honestly of how can I get people out of their heads and into their hearts and into their bodies and into their voices and through I use a lot of stories and examples from my my clients with their permission anonymously this is what happened with a singer I was working with or you know I was reading a book about this just really kind of in the moment um, experiences that have moved me. So I hope that they'll move readers and I get really beautiful feedback uh, on them. So they're a joy to write They're they, It's a joy to, to hopefully be of service and sharing them. And um, yeah, they, they, they bring a lightness to some, sometimes the wonderful heaviness of writing a book that they balance each other. Well, mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, good to hear that. I, I've had some experience writing articles, but uh, there's no, that hasn't been this like thirsty audience, you know, so I, it was just more of a, a practice to see if I can do it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm enjoying writing books. Um, uh, anyway, just one practical question. Uh, so did, did Psychology Today say, um, whenever you want to send us an article, go ahead? Was, was it kind of like that? Yeah, so well, there's there's a distinction to make. So there's Psychology Today, the magazine, which is mm -hmm. the one that's published on the on the um, magazine shelves, and I think that comes out every month or two. And then there's Psychology Today Online, where people mm -hmm. they have a, a group of people who write articles for mainly the online platform, and I mainly write for the online platform. So what you do is you can submit as often as you want, and then you'll be assigned an editor. Um, who will edit and say, great, this is wonderful and publish it. Um, but you're definitely more self-directed in that. You have a lot more leeway. I mean, there's occasionally they'll say not appropriate or you need to fix this. But that's very different than the magazine where usually you have to send, I don't know if you or your listeners know, but you send a pitch, you know, and basically an outline of here's an idea I have. You might not hear back for months. Um, and then there's the, the process of writing it. The editing process is, is much more stringent because it's usually geared toward, in any magazine, the theme of that issue. Mm -hmm. um, so no, I've really loved the online psychology today because I have so much more um, leeway. And I also can, um, in, not just in terms of content, what I want to say and how I want to say it, but when I want to say it. So I usually mm -hmm. write about one a month. Um, mm -hmm one every two it depends um mm -hmm. so that's given me a flexibility in, in terms of my creativity but also again my process and how it integrates with my coaching practice and with books because if i'm feeling sort of stumped in an area of a book and i need a break i write a couple articles i'll do some other things and then i can come back or vice versa you mm -hmm. know I'm on an article i'm like let me go back into the deep waters of the, the book and swim around in that for a while and then you know, I'll be on a walk and I'll be like, oh, what about this for an article? So they feed each other. Mm -hmm. I could see that. Yeah, I, I've never had 
I don't know if, if that's fair to say. I haven't had luck with a blog. I don't know if that's being judgmental on myself. I've never had a blog that is being read by too many people unless I'm specifically asking friends to read it, you know? Um, but I, I don't publish it on my website. I, I haven't um, dared to go into the blog world, I don't know, blog site or something just because I don't want to do it, you know? It's more like an, an exercise that I think I should do because I'm a writer, you know? Oh, yeah. 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 And yeah. And uh, because how many, it's one of the things I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm good at writing, but, I, and I can write a decent article, but I just don't want to mm -hmm. do that, you know? Yeah. So I haven't stepped, I haven't tried to build it and therefore it hasn't been built much, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I am not, I should just preface this by saying I'm not technologically very savvy and I'm not, I mean, I love what I do, but there are other people who are much better at like promoting what they do. I've always been a very kind of let it grow organically kind of gal for better or worse. And thankfully it's, it's done well, I've done well, but your point about the blogging for your listeners more than you, because you don't enjoy writing as much. And I definitely say do what you love because, you know, you can only sort of force yourself to do things you don't love. It takes so much less energy to do the things you love. Right. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I, I mean, I wrote initially, I had a blog for years, kind of for myself, my clients, my parents and cousins would love it. But then, you know, because I loved it, I kept doing it. And then kind of like compound interest. Then, you know, I get contacted by some reporter who wanted to interview me and I'd be like, oh, I didn't know. Or and then psychology today, and I had no idea. So mm -hmm. um, I think you with your podcasts, perhaps, I mean, you, you obviously enjoy them. You're, you're great at them. You know, you'll be hopefully doing what you do, interviewing interesting people, and then you'll get a call. And I, I think that, well, this is an advice. It's just how I live, choose to live my life because as we all know today, there's so many people that are like, upscale your business you can make millions by this and and god bless everybody who, who, for whom that works but for me um I, I just love working with clients i give master classes every month on in person and nowadays on zoom and i just do the things i love that nourish my soul and that, mm -hmm. that i feel are a contribution and it's been a real blessing to hear the feedback that those things that really move me tend, seem to move others too so Mm -hmm. that's that's, yeah. my, that's my happy space and place okay yeah i guess that's the key that it's your happy space yeah like for me the podcast it's something i wouldn't have chosen that this is what i i would love doing but it's just this natural thing that my energy goes to i can do it i feel like i'm providing a service and yeah unlike unlike writing a blog you know yeah so uh yeah so that's good yeah good advice or good words of wisdom whatever you want to say towards do what you love and let it grow organically. I mean, it's very much the way I live. Yeah, was that lightning? Yeah, yeah but we're still on. So yeah, we're still on. Very good. Look all you want lights. Just don't cut <laughs> off the internet again. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I think I really think uh, that's and that's the spirit of this this podcast. Really, is that uh, it's not how to make a million bucks. It's not even how to better your game. It's uh, I would say, if anything, how to be your most natural self. Mm. You know you know, it's a, it's a podcast about humans, human to human, yeah. real life, just ordinary, extraordinary and ordinary people yeah. just having talks that hopefully anyone could relate to, you know? Well, it's funny, you know, you talked about extraordinary and ordinary, and I, I'm a big language lover. And then as a coach, and again, redirect me if I'm going off target or time, but, you know, in singing, maybe this is the same for guitar, but, you know, words like high and low, just those word boxes, you know, can really influence how we relate to things and, um, you know, to push or to support. They, so I'm very careful with my language, but I've always marveled at how, you know, the word extraordinary, extraordinary, if you think about it, mm -hmm. you know, people who are extraordinary, many of them are truly extraordinary. They're just, they've allowed, they've, many in my experience have given up trying to be something they're not and have almost surrendered into the ordinariness of who and how they are. And, and that's when their gifts blossom in mm -hmm. the, the fertile soil of just being themselves and not trying to be something other than who they are. So I've always loved that, that that's how we language it, you know, or mm -hmm. extra ordinary, you know? Yeah, no, I, I love that. I, I, I may have noticed I haven't noticed it in that particular way you put it, but I definitely 
it always sticks out when I say extraordinary, I, when I say extraordinary, because I hear, I see the extra and the ordinary. Yeah. And I'm like, hmm, why would I want to be more than ordinary? I don't know why, you know, <laughs> but yeah. what's wrong with being ordinary, you know, in other words. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 had, I had a great opportunity to meet with a former student yesterday. I hadn't seen him in six years. He reached out recently and said, hey, you know, want to hang out? And uh, I was, I was all about it because, uh, you know, it's all about the human connection for me. Yeah. And I was, tell, I was talking about how death really helps me to put everything I do today and any day in perspective. And I say, when I think about my own death, I want to um, really just feel that I've lived. And I, I said to him, I really want to feel like I really lived in my most to be, I really lived in a way that allowed me to be my most natural self. Mm hmm and he uh and I, I was a little surprised when i said that just because i never maybe said it in that way before maybe i have i don't know but he said oh that's interesting because uh you know I, I i try to be my best version of my best self and i said yeah i definitely have been striving for that for a long time but uh he said he had never heard anyone want to be their natural self as like a something to strive for yeah and i i real and i explained that the reason I prefer to think that way instead of being my best self is because best sounds like uh, it sounds like I may have to try harder than I need to, to be who I am, yeah. you know, when, right. like you're saying, allowing the settling of the ordinariness, that's my most natural self. So I, I've always been an overachiever really my whole life. So to be my most natural self is a step towards being extra and more extraordinary because I always didn't want to be so ordinary, you know? So allowing myself to be as ordinary as possible or my most natural self yeah. is allowing my my roots to sink deeper into the earth mm -hmm. and to grow more you yeah. know well i love your tree metaphor i mean that was my first word trees by the way when i was a baby so i've always been a huge nature lover but it's funny you mentioned trees because i think we don't look at trees and go is that the best tree no it's just <laughs> a tree and in its perfect ordinariness it's totally extraordinary and i think human beings are the same you said something, John, if you don't mind me mentioning you about death, that it reminds me, I don't know, you mentioned poetry in an email too. And I, I love Mary Oliver's poetry. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she has one poem that's called When Death Comes. And we actually had it read at our wedding, which might sound odd to talk about death at the wedding, but I resonate with what you said because, um, and I can't recite the whole thing and I'll get all emotional if I try. <laughs> but it basically talks about, um, I'm going to butcher this, but you know, when death comes, like, I think she says, like an ice pick between the, sh the shoulder blades and like, you know, the measle pox and, you know, someone comes to buy me and, and I, you know, takes the coins from his purse with the, it's just all these, these, these views of, you know, when death comes and I want to look at that time full of wonder. And at the end, she says, oh gosh, I'm going to cry. She goes, when it's over, I want to say all my life I was, a, I'm gonna, I think this is right. All my life I was like a bride married to amazement. All my life I was like the groom taking the world into to my arms. Mm -hmm. And I, it's so interesting because yeah, I mean, it's the idea that the thought of death is what makes you turn to the light of this moment and go, oh my gosh, when death comes, I wanna appreciate this moment. Yeah. And so I get it is my point. <laughs> so much so that it was at our wedding <laughs> yeah i oh yeah no i could see definitely uh on on uh kismet if that's the right word yeah. definitely see yeah. things uh similarly um yeah there's a a, a buddhist quote from uh nitrin daishonin that says something along the lines of uh like first learn about death and then you'll understand how to live mm -hmm. you know something to that effect so study death yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I've had a quite a open, open relationship with death most of my life. My father died when I was six, so it became real close to me so early on. Yeah. And uh, and then I've had a, a number, like a long string. Like at some point, I was tempted of like boasting how many more people died in my life than yours type <laughs> when I was a kid, you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, but I, I really do feel mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, I don't, I don't think death is bad. Of course, I don't want my son to die or my mother or wife or friends, but, but I really, uh, I don't feel that there's anything wrong with it, of course, you know? Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, 
basically it, it, it colors, it colors every, every moment of my life. Cause if, um, you know, with my, my dad died when he was 36, now I'm 40. So I've been writing my autobiography this past year plus. That's what kind of drove me to go to the book dealers group. Yeah. And, you know, some people say, well, you're pretty young. Why are you going to write it? Um, first of all, like, I have plenty of stories to fill a book, believe me. But also, I don't know if I'm going to live tomorrow, you know? So I yeah. want to get this started because for me, if my dad had left some stories for me, I would really be happy about that. Or think of other, I don't know, Jimi Hendrix or something. If he wrote an autobiography, wouldn't we appreciate that? We Ooh. wouldn't have said, oh, he was too young. He shouldn't have done that, you know? Totally. Oh, that's so, uh, well, I'm sorry about your, your father and, and all the many losses. Um, but it sounds like you've, you've taken some things that would literally cripple other people and turned it into something extraordinary for yourself and your son, which is really beautiful. Yeah, thank you. I, I think we all have that opportunity, you know, of course, uh, we're all e well equal, I believe. And uh, as, as, as well as super we're unique. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're ordinary. And also super unique, you know, as, as you pointed to, just like each tree. If you, when I was in the Catskills last week and, you know, spending time with the trees, they're all, if you do spend time with them, they're all quite different. But from a distance, they all look very similar, right? The same almost, yeah. uh, depending on how close you are. Um, yeah, they, they, I don't know. There was one, one more. Uh, oh, yeah. In high school, I wrote a song called Nice Day to Die in my heavy metal band, you know. <laughs> So and, you probably write something about that. Yeah. Yeah, that was morbid. I'm not going to sing it nowadays. But at the same time, I did feel that, you know, there there will be a day when I die. So I hope it's I hope it, I feel like this is the nice day to go. You know, this is a nice day to die, you know. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> um, so back to back to you. Uh, do you feel that creative expression is a key component to maintaining, perhaps acquiring? Uh, healthy mind, body, and spirit? Mm, yeah, kind of, <laughs> sort of, kind of. Um, you know, I think just to, to, to take a step back, I think that going back to language, you know, the language I think can, can really help us or hinder us. And I think that words like creative or even expression where maybe for you and I, they can be um, helpful. Um, I think that they, they tend to lock us into thinking about certain things. Like when you and I maybe hear people hear creative expression, we think singing, dancing, writing, who knows, a, a host of things. Um, and I think it can sort of leave out or leave on the sidelines people who their creative expression, which I do think is important to, to be to be fully expressed or fully present. Yes, I, I agree. But I, I don't think that it requires what we would traditionally call creative expression to make that happen. I mean, I think that one can be to use these words creatively expressed, um, you know, being present in nature, walking through the trees, um, being a great mother, being a great friend. Um, working hard at it, working hard and doing your best at a job you don't care about. I mean, I think being, al being alive, I guess is what I'm saying is there's an opportunity to be creatively expressed in every moment that we're alive if we choose it. And I don't know that actual creative expression is required to be creatively expressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. I told you, yeah, I, I, could, I could definitely see with you why you would be hesitant to just kind of say yes to that because creative expression is a bit of a loaded uh, phrase maybe these, that it comes these, with ideas yeah yeah so I just wanted to clarify that yes I think is the answer to the question and that it can mean so many things and it, it might have nothing to do with what we might or some might call creativity I mean I know mm -hmm. we were just our family we were just um, my family we were just on the, the water and we would uh, on the eastern shore and we were I'd wake up in the morning and I'd go out in the kayak and I'd see these fishermen with their crab pots. And, you know, I don't know what's in their mind, on their minds and in their hearts, but it, it looked like an act of reverence, this dawn, you know, they're out there every morning at the same time, putting the crab pots in with the mist all on the water and mm -hmm. pink. And I, I was moved to tears and I was like, you know, creativity and creative expressions everywhere. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I do think that could be a great book to like to to break down the walls and what people think is creative because choosing which uh, chopsticks you want to use for dinner is very creative you know i mean 
it's so, uh, so is appreciating the chopsticks just like like look at those chopsticks right That's yeah creative act too so yeah so i hope that answers your question <laughs> yeah it, I, I think uh I, I hope it gives me i hope our listeners uh a different way to think about creativity and what what that could mean you know um it, it brings to mind this concept that i've been kind of holding a lot in these past few years which is input versus output mm. uh and there's this one uh youtube um sp spiritual uh motivating type of guy uh i don't know how else to put it um yeah teacher inf influencer but very really wonderful guy to listen to named inf infinite waters oh, okay. and uh He's a dark skinned guy and he talks about talks about race issues. He talks about um, how we're all human. I've never seen a white person, never seen a black person, you know, because he's talking about literally, I mean, our skin is not white and there's nobody who's pitch black, you know. So, <laughs> you know, so it, it's fun to hear from him uh, because he is a very dark skinned guy. And he explains that uh, race came from a guy named Blumenbach in the uh, 1700s which was just like a setup, a concept that was introduced to divide us and, and, and to play power games and stuff. And it's pretty fascinating. Um, and yeah, so uh, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure where I was going with this. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, so input versus output. So he says that, so this guy puts out a video every single day. Uh, he puts out a, like a 20 minute talk and he has, must have 3000 plus video, 4,000 maybe now. Wow. and. Uh, and they're all good and they they he has put, put some music behind them and he's he smiles the whole time you're like holy cow like this guy's delivering something really valuable to people you know he has millions of subscribers at this point but uh he says i don't know at some point maybe several years ago he said that he he uh, allows it for every like maybe he takes in 30 percent input and puts out 70 percent so input versus output. So he says the majority of people take in like 90% or 90% input, 10% output. And which is why so many of us feel stifled and stymied and clogged up. But when you're on the output, when your output is higher than your input, that's, that's a create, that's creative life. So yeah. it doesn't mean you have to do it on by making videos and, and put on stuff on YouTube or Facebook. But if you're unplugged and you're cooking and you're spending, you know, more than 50% of your day, doing something that is not prescribed that you're just choosing and of your own free will, then yeah. you're more output than input, you know? I think that's so fast. You know, what that, that brings to mind for me, I love that I've never heard of him, so I'll check him out. But um, I definitely noticed that when I have a day or a week that's more giving master classes, giving, inter you know, interviews like this, where I'm, maybe it's output, I'm being I'm not in my head thinking, writing, crafting, organizing, scheduling, da, 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 da. But when I'm, I don't know if this is what he saw you were talking about, but for me, my, my experience of that is when I'm, when I'm out in the world, out of my head, in relationship, in dynamics and in, in communication and conversation, I definitely feel more alive and creatively expressed, even when I'm writing a great article or a, a book, when I'm in my head about it. So, um, that's something that came to mind when you were mentioning that, that there's that aspect of output versus input, you know, um, mm -hmm. that resonates for me. Yeah, I, I, I could see that. I think what he was just to, for clarity, I think what he was saying was that input, yeah. that yeah. input in terms of uh, like media that someone else created that's coming in, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. that, that will then essentially influence our energy level, will influence yeah. our, uh, our thinking. As yeah. opposed to if when we're the creators, that's why that's a big part of the reason I do the podcast from him hearing his message so long and others like him mm -hmm. just saying, you know, your voice is yours. Just use it, whatever yeah. it is, the world needs it. And I kept on thinking like there is this wave of negative media, like every day it's available in an overwhelming amount. Mm -hmm. And if I could just be a counterbalance to that, yeah. um, just by being saying, okay, I'm going to be in uh, output mode. Yeah. I'm going to be in output mode uh, as I'm going to just do it. And it doesn't matter. I'm not going to, you know, trying to judge the quality of it. Like mm -hmm. if, if our internet connection goes or doesn't, that's fine because yeah. it's a choice to be in output mode. It's a choice to make that human connection. 
to make this archive uh, interview available for people who just want to hear two human beings talk about things that are not scary, <laughs> that are not uh, not trying to sell anybody anything, not trying to inspire fear, but just more connection, love vibration, you know? So, and then, you know, I feel good when I do it. It could be tiring because it could be a lot of work involved to do output. But uh, at the same time, I feel like I, I just feel like my life floats to the surface you know to, yeah. to the to the top of the lake you know? <laughs> totally. Totally. yeah yeah well can i can i say something about so the the literal the literal meaning of what he's talking about that you just um clarified it's when i'm writing books which is usually you know often or articles i actually don't listen to i don't read other books and i don't listen to music as much as i love music um, I, or I, I don't really take in a lot of media at all, um, because, uh, I find that I get very influenced by it. Um, and I really like to have kind of a silence from which hopefully my ideas, of course, influenced by others comes out. So, um, I know a lot of people ask me like, what do you listen to? And, and if I'm in the process of writing, which can be a year long, if not more process, I, nothing, I mean, I'll hear if I'm in a restaurant or if I'm out or, occasionally, but I really don't read or listen to much because I just kind of try to be in the silence of like, you know, <laughs> output rather than, you know, influencing myself with, with different inputs. So that might be yeah. interesting. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think so. I think that's exactly what he's, he's talking about. And, and what that speaks to me of is this concept of deep work. Have you ever heard the book Deep Work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that this I, I don't know if you know the speaker or if you've read it, but I remember being impressed by the idea for those who haven't heard it that if if you get if when you decide to do deep work or like writing a book is certainly deep work or even an article or really anything that requires constant you know like a certain level of concentration, if you get disrupted by a text, a phone call, a doorbell ringing, even mm -hmm. uh, it takes twenty minutes for our brain to settle down to that level of depth before. Yeah. before we can actually like concentrate on the level we were at. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I've been for the longest time, I, I've been doing not the longest time, but for quite a while now, airplane mode, really 90% of my day, I'm in airplane mode. Yay. I, <laughs> oh, I could not agree more. Please. You're preaching. You're, you're preaching, preaching to the choir. Happy. Oh, to a very happy choir. I, I, you, this is so important. P yeah. Go on. It's, you're right. It's, it's very important for people to know this. Like when I, I told some people about it yesterday, uh, friends of, my, of ours that are older generation, and they didn't even know about airplane mode really. And, and they're probably going to bed with the phone near the head, you know, on. Yeah. All that. No, I'm, that's a, I totally am with you on that. I think, yeah, I, I, I haven't put a phone against my head in over 15 years. So <laughs> good for you. Very, we're probably very much in alignment on all that. And yeah, I think that people just, they wake up and they look at their phone. They, whenever it dings, they look at it. And, and I, I get that way too. You know, I have a son. So if we're to, it's a play date or my dad and then, but yeah, it takes so long because you might, you might be in your work and then you think, oh, let me just quickly text someone. And then you check something. And then even if you come right back to it, your mind is still out there thinking about that. And it's, it's not, it just takes you out of being present. And it is it's, you don't have to be present every minute. And I think that you can be present with technology, but I think for most of us, we fall victim to the design of a lot of technology, which is literally designed to get us addicted. So, <laughs> I, so that's a problem, you know, that yeah. I think that most people don't, we're not just, we often don't discipline ourselves enough to say, you know, it takes work to use it as a tool of my own making and choosing rather than to default to it being a thing that that literally consumes me. Oh yeah, oh it yeah, takes, eat, eat you right up. My work, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I I just have to quote Infinite Waters again for a second here. Um, he says, uh, "Every you know, we live in a world, a society that's everything is backwards." He says, "Human beings were designed to be loved and things to be used. Now we love our iPhone and we use people." Oh. You so know. unfortunately true beautifully said yeah wow. and it's it's those things that he'll like repeat to you day after day and just like thank him for repeating him like yeah i preach yeah. <laughs> it, 
it, it's fun to, if, if you get a chance to listen to him. It yeah, doesn't yeah. matter which video because he's just putting new ones out every day. I'm going to drop that down. Infinite Waters. Yeah, and I'll put that in the show notes as well as one of the things we talked about. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, but I imagine your early to bed, early to rise does help you with staying into deep work, right? And, and also not putting the, the music on and stuff because mm -hmm. I'm sure you have distractions, you know, if you're married and you have a kid and family, but still, yeah, that must help. Yeah, I mean, and I could, I have so many thoughts about that particular part. You know, I, I used to think, uh, my husband and I often joke, like we used to think before we had a child, we were so busy. And now it's like, <laughs> there's anything to go back to being that busy. But um, I have learned and I'm still learning that busy is an overwhelm, our, our concepts, really, they're, they're not really the result, in my, in my opinion, of circumstance. I mean, I can have days where I don't have much going on and I feel overwhelmed and I can have days like today was one where there's just so much going on and I feel completely present and in it and in flow and great. So, um, so yeah, my life has definitely gotten busier in terms of things on the schedule, but I, I have, I'm learning, you know, I, I'm going to quote Lena Horn badly again. I wish I had, you know, had these things on my wall, but she says she was a very famous singer and she said, and I'm going to butcher it and I apologize, John and everyone, but it's not, it's not the load that weighs you down. It's the way you carry it. I think is how she said it. You could Google it. Lena Horn. It's, it's not the load you carry. It's not the load that weighs you down. It's how you carry it. And it, I remember when I heard that for the first time, I was like, damn, that's <laughs> true. Because there are people who carry loads far heavier than mine and live lives in present grace, right? Mm -hmm. And then there are people who have less going on that are totally stressed out, you know, and <laughs> I can be both of those things. So, um, but, and then to your point about early rising, you know, that's never been a choice for me. I've always just, that's my, my clock. And I have clients and friends who go to bed at three and four in the morning and wake up at one. I can't even wrap my head around that, but that's, <laughs> That's their flow. And I, the one thing that I think is consistent among all of us is that whenever you're, whenever and wherever you find your sacred time, you know, for my late night friends, it's like when everyone's in bed at one o'clock in the morning and they can go do their thing, that's their time. And for me, when I wake up at these days about five, because it's, you know, a couple hours before everybody else in the house wakes up, you know, I have my tea, I go for my walk, I'll write or I'll do whatever. And it's like, that's my time. And so um, and again, I think a big part of that is John, really the phone's not ringing, you know, there's people aren't texting, they're not emailing. I mean, it's so if we don't have the discipline, we probably could have that same flow time at 1 PM, but you know, this guy is, is digging a lot. more. <laughs> people are calling a lot more. So I think, I think that's a big part of, I'm a morning person by nature, but I've also learned to really, um, I have found that you know, letting myself be in love with that precious time in the morning has really worked for me. Yeah, I could, I could, uh, it sounds like it. And so, and your energy, you know, exudes that, I think, that you know where your precious time is and you know how to give it to yourself and you do so that you can have your cup overflowing to give good vibes, you know? Not always, just to be clear, like I'm not great. <laughs> but I mean, yes, I, you know, often. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we haven't had one-on-one -on -one, uh, interactions too much, but uh, from the vibes that I've, I've gotten from you and your um, now and your emails and your overall presence online and stuff. Uh, that's, well, that's really kind. I appreciate that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I was re reminded when you said that you quiet time when you write almost for a year, which <laughs> mind boggling to me, but I, I can understand they, they, I had a periods of time where didn't want to listen to music for at all and I wasn't particularly writing but mm -hmm. or maybe I was I I wrote three guitar books that were like how to learn guitar with a single string single string songs oh, cool. so that was a huge project so I, I those are out I put out a, an ebook a while ago but this this these books I'm working on now are like my first like story style book right well a prose based book yeah. Um, one is my autobiography where I'm not teaching really anything. And the other one's about the importance of being aware of the energy of music. Make sure you are aware that it's negative energy and try to, you know, be cautious and use it for the, book, the positive. So those are two books. But anyway, when I write my autobiography, particularly, 
I love, I go in the garage, I put on uh, incense. I, I, I have a cassette tape collection of all sorts of, you know, 80s metal and stuff like that, 90s. And I just put it on and I write, or I, I copy old journals as part of the process, or I like work with old archive recordings and I put on YouTube as part of reliving my life so I could write the story. But mm -hmm. I, I do take, I do a lot of input, but it's very controlled input. You know, I, I like to call it like closed loop, closed loop input. So, you know, when you go on Spotify, YouTube, that's open loop and you don't know what you're going to get. You're going to get advertisements. You're going to get so many distractions. But if you take that cassette tape of Def Leppard hysteria and you put it on, <laughs> that's all you're going to get from beginning to end. Totally. And you could put the volume down and, you know, I can tune it out. I don't I, I could put it low enough that I don't hear the words. And, yeah. you know, the incense, it creates a vibe. And for me, I just, that's my happy space. Yeah. And I don't really consider that uh, input, although I do on some degree, but, but more or less it's, yeah. it's a merger of input output, you know, in a way, because uh, I'm more output at that time yeah. and it, it, it's good for my soul too. So. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in as a contrast to writing styles. No, I, I, I love that. You know, I, it, it makes me think, you know, the, the reason, by the way, I don't listen to music when I'm writing is because I can't, I can't listen. I just get too distracted. Like if there's anything with lyrics in particular, even yeah. without lyrics, like if you go to a Starbucks and you're working, like I'll just start singing along with the stuff. I'm just, music <laughs> is so in my blood that I'll just, I, I can't, I can't, you know? And then- yeah. Um, and I love it. So there'll be times, of course, I'll listen to music, but I just, it's not when I'm in that space because it's just a distraction. I, I, for years, this is funny. I don't think I've ever told anybody this. Whenever I would chew, I'd be singing along to a song of that rhythm. <laughs> Literally, that's how much music has always just been there for me. And I mean, I remember when I tried to break the habit, it was like, good Lord, that's a habit. I mean, I'd be talking with family, like out to a dinner and there's like a, like a song going in my head as I'm chewing. And the song would change depending on how I'm doing. So, I mean, it's just in my, beautifully in my blood, it's just in my blood. So if I'm trying to write or be present with someone and there's a song playing, it's just hopeless because my brain just goes, you know, what's, what's it about or what's the time signature or listen to what the wow. bass is doing or there's the harmony part. It's, it's just, a, so I've just learned like there's a time for it and it has to be a dedicated time for it. Mm, I see. Yeah, I, I totally get that because I've had that same many years of talking to people and while in the background, I'm just running scales in my head I, I, and I couldn't stop it, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm trying to be present, but I'm saying, do 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 I I dated one musician in my life, a, a drummer and we're, and we're still friends and uh, it was like too nutty. I mean, I, we both realized like, is this how nutty we both are? I mean, it was hilarious. Like literally we'd be like playing the drums in his head and I'd be singing it. It's like, this is, we're totally, we're totally crazy. <laughs> Last position I ever dated. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I don't, I, I dated someone who played music maybe twice, but not a musician. So it's a bit different. Yeah, so, <laughs> but anyways, please go ahead. Yeah, so <laughs> if you're okay, I have a few more questions for you. Are you okay on oh, time? I know. No, I'm great, please. Yeah. As many All right, cool. So you've published two successful books about the art of singing. How has your experience been in finding your voice as an author? So let's go some from singing with your voice to now mm -hmm. finding your voice as an author where you basically said you prefer to do that in silence. Sounds mm -hmm. like a big change. I can understand it since I'm a singer and a writer too, but how has that transition been? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I never thought I would be a coach. I certainly never thought I'd be a therapist. I never thought I'd be a writer. I mean, when I was growing up, all I wanted to do was sing. And um, and I really love all those things. I love working with people. I love, you know, the psychology and I love to write. I really, I love it. So the, how was, I think you said, how was the experience of finding my voice as a writer? You know, the first book really is, I think I said, it literally started as like, a series of emails. Um, people would ask me questions in person or over email. And I just found that I was saying them again, the same answer kind of again and again. And someone, and I don't remember who said, you should write that down in a book. It never occurred to me when I was emailing these long answers back, like, am I writing? I thought I was just emailing kind of thing. Right, right. And so I started gathering them and I, I, I realized some of them were about language. Some of them were about how do we learn best? Some of them were about fear some of them were about technique and uh, some a lot of them were about the misconceptions of singing and those became the chapters of the book you know um, and there's a couple more 
And so the first book really was, um, I felt like in my memory, of course, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting, but really kind of like an act of service. Like there's a lot of people for whom, and it sounds like you might be one of them, singing is just so hard physically or psychologically or performing in the fear. And for me, for whatever reason, it was always such a, an easy organic gift. And I, it used to break my, it still breaks my heart when it's not that way for people. And so this, the first one was just like, here's what I know about how I think I can help you out of that those that cage that cage of unhappiness or whatever you want to call it so that was beautiful but I don't even know that I thought of it as like writing a book it was more like I don't know that I have the answers but here's my answers and I hope it helps so that's the first mm -hmm. book. and then the second book the second art of singing book was different because I had already published a book I by that point and recognized it was a book it was becoming successful so then there was this whole other thing like am I a writer now, you know, <laughs> patience for this book. So there was that whole thing. And so it did. And I was, um, I started it before I was pregnant. I wrote it while pregnant also. And then while my, after my son was born. So I also went through a personal evolution, you know, um, you know, so I began kind of like being a little attached to the book and it has to be a certain way. And then was wonderfully distracted by pregnancy and my son. And like, you know, all I need to do is just speak my truth and, and share what I've learned. It doesn't have to be great. It just has to be what I know. And so then I got back to that original place of, I don't think of myself as a writer, I'm just sharing. And then it be, I, think it, I think it turned out really well. So mm. I, I guess <laughs> to answer, try to answer your question directly, I think that where singing for me was something I never thought about. Like, I never had to think like, am I a good singer, a bad singer? Am I humble or am I not? It just was sort of like my right arm was my voice. And I never assigned any egoic stuff it was just my voice I had to sort of unlearn learn and unlearn and relearn some things about my relationship with writing that it can be and hopefully has become more like an extension of that organic ordinariness uh like for me singing is that when it, I let it be ordinary like I'm just sharing what I know hopefully for some it can become extraordinary mm -hmm. cool yeah wow so I like that you said that um, you getting a little, it sounded like getting a little stuck, maybe when the second book, maybe some expectations, are you an author and distractions, of course, being pregnant is a huge thing. Uh, but then when you just said, whatever, I'm just going to share what I know, and then it kind of flowed again. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I could see a lot of people getting hung up on just terms like author, right? Oh, like yeah. writer, uh, singer. But cool. if you just like do it, this is something I do, I sing. Yep. Uh, something I do, I write. Um, yep. Yeah, it, it might be a little bit more. Yeah, it, it, our society doesn't do a great job of uh, encouraging people to be their natural self. You yeah. know? It's like who, who, what you do is who you are. And it's like, no, it's, no. What, it's one of the things you choose to do. Absolutely. In my experience, and everyone's different. So I wanna be clear that that's how I feel. It's funny, we just had a masterclass, I gave a masterclass on Sunday, we had this very conversation, John, about how I've never been able to really say I'm a singer, I just that doesn't feel comfortable, but I like, but what feels good to me is, but I'm a person who sings, and then other people were like, oh, but I love claiming I'm a singer, it gives me mm -hmm. power, so again, language, it's like, however, whatever language works for you, or for, you know, and, and then becoming conscious of that, and using it intentionally and powerfully, that's, that's what matters. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that that is an interesting uh, distinction. I, I I did say I've have on this talk that I'm a singer, but normally I don't say that. I say it because it relates. But normally I would say I'm a singer songwriter mm -hmm. because I feel like my strength is songwriting. Yeah. Uh, and to just say I'm a songwriter isn't really fair because I almost always sing my songs. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Uh, there was something else that, that that popped up with that, but uh, yeah, I, I do think for writers, like f I found for myself as a writer, this feeling of I, like I can't write a novel, or at least I'd have no inclination for that. So I, I could write, but but it's not not this lifetime, right? Most likely. And then, uh, am I just like? Am I just giving my opinion? You know, sometimes I wonder about that. You know, am I just like, 
but then I read, I read so much and I'm like, everyone's just sharing what they could share. That's all it is. That's yeah. all anyone can do. They yeah. share what they could share. And I remember finding that as a songwriter, like there were so many heavy metal songs I liked when I was a teenager and I tried to write my first one that was in this style. And it just never sounded anything like that. It was just a totally different thing that came out. I'm like, that's the song I'm writing, you know? <laughs> and yeah. that would happen over and over again. And I, I realized because I'm writing in my style. Yeah. You know, I could try to copy other people's and it just sounded too much like them. And yeah. it wasn't fun because it really wasn't natural. And I think writing is like that. We, we might see an author we like and we try to write like them or think our, we should resemble them in some way, but we don't. And then we think, wait, when am I really a writer then? <laughs> yeah. But, but our voice can be totally unique. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in terms of uh, how you feel about singing as uh, someone that's very, you're a person who sings and it's just so much a part of you that you're able to kind of surpass your ego. It's just that ingrained in you. Uh, that's how I have felt about guitar for so long. That mm -hmm. like, like you just, I, I'm, I have no fear of anyone contesting my guitar skill, you know, like that type of thing. Like I, I could do it. It's just, I got it, you know, not that I'm definitely not the best, but uh, what does that even mean anyway, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for your listeners and for you, if you haven't heard of Victor Wooten, do you know Victor Wooten, the bass player? Mm hmm I played with Bella Fleck, you know, made his own instrument. Um, he wrote a book called The Music Lesson that I think is a really beautiful spiritual primer about a, a beautiful relationship with, with music that I recommend to a lot of my clients. And I think it's just a phenomenal book. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I'll, I'm going to ask you about some books in a minute. In a, well, not a minute, a few minutes. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the Victor Wooten book came up maybe two or three interviews ago. So now you're the second person who told me that. Yeah. Oh, cool. And now I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Really amazing. I mean, there's so, we'll go on now. I'm thinking of other books that he alluded to it, but um, yeah, no, he's, he's amazing. And just that. Yeah. I mean, I, I could go on and on about so many things. You asked some great questions. And I love this conversation, but mm -hmm. please go ahead. <laughs> Um, yeah, I know there's, there's a lot of sparks going on. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us one of the great lessons you've learned along your journey that helps you remain positive, upbeat, you know, f moving forward? Oh, that's a great question. Positive lesson. Um, well, there are a few that come to mind. I mean, I think that I have, we all have strengths and limitations. Um, one of my strengths, I think my greatest strengths is that I, I love and I trust people. I, I, you know, like everybody, I've been hurt, I've been disappointed, but for whatever reason, I love and trust people. And I've, I've made some beautiful friends in and out of the music business. And I think so one positive lesson is just, um, and I don't, I don't know that I actually ever thought about like continue to love and trust. It's just, I guess to say it more accurately, loving and trusting is is um, are the two most wonderful and smartest things you can that I believe we can do, and they've never really let me down. I mean, I can consider myself to be very vulnerable. That vulnerability is a strength. Um, just to love and trust, and um, that that will lead lead you in the right direction. I've I've always found that to be true. And then the other thing I'd say that I've a positive lesson I've learned is that um, I think I alluded to this earlier, just make your mind up about what you want to do, take responsibility for yourself and your life. We can't control everything, but we can certainly be responsible for the things we can be. And, uh, and there's, there's a real pleasure in life or mind that comes from saying, I'm, you know, the captain of my fate, you know, I'm the master of my soul to, to mm -hmm. the quote. And, and there's something very rewarding at the end of every day going, I did the best I could and um, might not be right, might not be wrong, might succeed, might not, but, you know, I gave it my all to not make excuses, you know, to not be a victim. Um, so those, those are a couple of things. Uh, the ones that come first to my mind, I'm sure I could come up with a thousand more. <laughs> um, be humble, you know, begin always with beginner's mind. You know, I think that I've noticed that as a coach, certainly as a singer, but mainly as a coach, um, it's so easy after 20 years to, 
you know, you see come when someone come in and you kind of know what's going on with them, but just to remind yourself, you know, there might be some patterns, but see them newly, see everyone newly, see people newly, see yourself newly, you know, be willing to be surprised, um, be willing to be in awe and full of wonder um, of everyone and everything. Um, so those are a few that come to mind. Oh uh, yeah, really great. <laughs> um, I wrote a poem this morning when I woke up at 4 a.m. And uh, one of the lines was, uh, it's better to be present than to be clever. Mm -hmm. It just came to me, you know, in the middle of the night. Unless being clever springs from being present. <laughs> right, then, then, you just, then you just win all around. You just yeah. win all around. No, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, yeah, The Beginner's Mind, I, I love it. That, that, I remember reading that book, the Suzuki book. I don't know if you read yeah. the Beginner's yeah. Mind book, yeah. Yeah, 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 totally. I, was, I think I read it 2007 or something. And it was like after I finished my last band, heavy metal band, I was playing in a jazz band just to, as a gig to, uh, on weekends for some money. I was reading it. I, I'm not particularly into jazz, but I could play it. Yeah. And uh, I was like, yeah. As a teacher, I could see I was a little stuck. And I, I was, you know, my ego had grown a bit from being in the rock band and getting a lot of attention. And, yeah. and I was like, yeah, that beginner's mind is what got me to be good at guitar in the first place when I couldn't play a note, yeah. you know, and then I, I allowed as I got older, or I, as I developed to you to apply that to teaching to apply that to uh, learning foreign languages. And then I, I decided, okay, I'm going to just jump in. Okay, I went to Brazil for uh, about half a year doing humanitarian work. And they didn't really speak English. So I'm like, I'm just gonna make a fool out of myself you know, but that's the only way you can do it. And, and then I learned the language pretty well. And then I did the same thing in Japan a year later. Oh, that's so and cool. I pretty much learned Japanese. And I used that same thing. I took that same intensity of focus, which I applied to guitar when I was 11 and 12. And I put it, I said, no, no guitar for now, unless it just happens, just going to play, just going to focus on uh, language in term in terms of my energy for learning. And, uh, and when people want to laugh at me, when they want to rep reprimand me or, you know, correct me or uh, on the butt of jokes, great. Mm -hmm. That's who I'm going to be for now. I'm going to be like a, a five-year-old again or a four-year-old. And, yeah. and then I, I got it. And to the point where I have a command of it and I can communicate with people. And yeah, I, there's something that I couldn't have achieved if I wasn't willing to get that, that humility, that level of humility in the beginner's mind. Totally. You know, I, could I be better? Sure. But I could also have not have learned at all, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, and the podcast totally beginner's mind. Like how many times have I put out videos that got so few views or I just didn't do it great. But I just keep on flexing the muscle. And then eventually, you know, there's a body of work that emerges. Yeah. And one of those days I'm one day I'm like, I feel like, Oh, here I'm up. I'm hosting a podcast when it was just a dream a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's such an overused statement these days. I think like, it's not your what, like find your why, I think is what people say, like find your why. But I think there's a, there's a lot of truth in that. I mean, if, if you know, if you're pulled or called by why you want to do something like that first book of mine was like, I just wanted to give people the answers. You know, that motivation was pure, I guess, pure as a way to say it. And it just, there was no ego. And it was like, I just, I just wanted to answer people's questions. That was the why. And I think, so I, I'm very conscious of like when I feel stuck or egoic or, you know, any kind of anxiety for me is usually, or control freakiness usually is all ego somewhere, mask, you know, hiding. <laughs> and then I'm like, well, why am I doing this? What, why am I writing this next book? Because I think I should, because I'm supposed to, because my publisher wants it, because that's what you do. I mean, and always, 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 always my why is out of whack when I'm feeling, when I'm out of whack, my why is out of whack. You know, mm -hmm. so I go, well, why, why, why did I initially want to write this book? And if I, when I go, when I find in myself, you know, what the, I don't know, the, the, lang the best language for it, but, you know, the, the real, the, the, the true reason I wanted to do it, the heart reason I wanted to do it, when I find that and reconnect to that, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's easy sometimes to get distracted by or, to be undisciplined in my thinking and let the fear voice come in and sort of, you know, spin me around the other things. That's when I get into trouble. So that's, I've always found very helpful. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. How many times have I spent? Uh, I, I often, when I chant, and this isn't recommend a way to chant, but I often journal out my thoughts. Sometimes I just can't help it because I'm just feel cluttered and and it, just getting down to the bare bones. Trying to be as honest as I can. You know, like you, you could do this journaling at any time of day, but sometimes when I'm chanting, it comes out just very naturally. Yeah. And I just write what's in my heart and it always comes down just to the basics. Like I want to connect with people. I want to feel healthy. I want to feel vibrant. I want to feel fully creatively expressed. I, I feel I have so much potential that I just want to honor, honor that as much as I can, even though I know that my purpose on here may be a lot bigger than just honoring my own creativity. Yeah. But I still want to do that because if I don't, who's going, going to, you know, and, mm -hmm. and just tr try to really just, and I've always been, the name of my autobiography, by the way, is Truth Seeker. And for so long, I, I thought I had, I was going to write this rock star dream story, but it's just my life story is not that. It's much more of a, what's called a spiritual autobiography. Like uh, if you ever heard of Thomas Merton, his seven story mountain is this story yeah. of, you know, going down the path of uh, um, materialistic, you know, pleasure seeking path of material gains or external, finding that's not it. And then discovering more of a middle path. Um, but it's kind of the story of Buddha in a way too. Um, and I do feel that uh, my path is, every person's story is worth telling. Yeah. Which is why a big part of the reason of this podcast, I'm like, I want to tell my story, but nobody's knocking on my door to, to interview me. So maybe if I offer this to other people, they could, other people can enjoy telling their story, mm -hmm. you know, and in the process, my story will come out as well. So you know, it's this, um, yeah, uh, I, I, again, I lost a thread. <laughs> this happened to me a lot. I'm just getting on these, these tangents that are inspired. I love inspired it. Inspired moments. You know, what you said made me think of something we talked about earlier about when you asked me something like, how did I, my career go the way it did? And, and I said, you know, a lot of people in life look like um, overnight sensations, you know, or overnight success stories. And I mean, most of the time when you look at what what really happened it's like they literally worked their butts off for a decade and then something clicked and so i, I think as as people looking at success those who are successful in the fields we want to be successful in it's so easy to forget that like best somebody's a best-selling author or someone has a great podcast and it's like oh i want to do that or so a great singer or a great parent or whatever a great relationship and i think that we have to remind ourselves that our culture markets and promotes the final product, like the great book, the great podcast, the great marriage, but we don't honor and give time and attention and, and viewing time to the process that got them there. And I, it's so important to remember that, that I, I think a lot of people I work with, they, they look at sort of the growing pains and the learning processes like a struggle or unfortunate or something you have to slog through. And it's like, no, that's, that's, I that's mean, it. that's it. Yeah. And, yeah. and I wonder sometimes what would happen if as, as a culture, we, we spend less time looking at like the New York times bestselling book. And we're like, well, tell us about the hellaciousness of writing the book or <laughs> tell us about those 10 years before anyone knew your name, like, tell us about that. And if we really kind of honored that and, and sort of glorified that, I, I think people's creative journeys would be so much more pleasurable and creative, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh man, that, that's exactly uh, the feeling I, I was wrestling with when I, which was kind of building me to make, wanted to create this, this podcast, which was, uh, I, I was a big fan of podcasts. There were a few that I liked, but even the ones that were the most closely aligned to me still had this element of like, look at this success of this person. Even if it was like a, not a well-known person, it was still like their success. Oh, I sold this many units of something. I have this many subscribers. My yeah. mailing list grew to ten thousand, and, and I'm like, <laughs> now I feel like crap. You know, I have, you know, and yeah. and it always like generated this anxiety in me, and I'm like, this can't be good. You know, sometimes it got me very inspired and lit up, but then I saw the reality of my day, of my week. I'm like, I don't have that much time, so I can't even do a fraction of the things I'm learning but I want to consume podcasts, yeah. but I want to consume podcasts. I'm going to bring me down to a human speed. And that's so in the design of this one, I thought let's music philosophy, let's talk music, let's talk about philosophy, let's talk about whatever else comes up. 
Hello. And let's just hear ordinary people, yeah. you know, like reaching out rather than reaching up, you know, like let's reach out and connect hands oh, and let's just, God. you know, share our stories and re recognize. I always thought I would practice, like if someone interviewed me, yeah. how did you, were you successful with you? You know, I put out books. So I'm like, how, how was, what was it like writing your book or tell us your success? I would try to, you know, fantasize about getting to that level. And I'm like, I really want to be able to remind, to remember what, if I get to that level that I want to tell people, some of you may feel really not crappy, but some of you may feel like this is really out of your reach. Mm -hmm. This is so like distant from you. Cause that's how I felt, even though I knew my potential and everything. And I, and I had the same thought that you were alluding to, which was just want to tell them about the struggle, but I don't want to like a, what was me? You have to struggle thing, but just that it, this, the journey is really, this is the journey. I was even tempted to put out a, like a podcast, how to create a very, how to create a YouTube channel with a few subscribers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, I have 500 some subscribers. I've been a YouTube for, I took it seriously since 2014. So that's not impressive for time, the length of time I've done it, but I really feel like I've been a gardener and just each, there are flowers that are growing a part of my garden. And uh, it stays, it steadily, very super slowly grows. And, and I'm fine with that because that it's, it just seems like something real that I've built from the ground up, yeah. you know, and I'd like to teach people how to do that, but it seems like people would much rather to get 10,000 subscribers in their first year, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but this, what you're saying, this dialogue of like, let's talk about really yeah. the process. Yeah. And enjoying the journey. Because I mean, that's where we are. That's where everybody is, you know. Even the people who've made it are still in it, you know. So whatever that means, made it, you know. I totally, I, I resonate with what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what aspects uh, did I ask you this? What aspects of your life help you to recover from setbacks? No, you didn't ask me that. Um, okay. Well, I think interestingly, it's the same, the same answer to a very different question. I mean, I think that my relationships, my trust and love, I think really are true. Honestly, I mean, I'm thinking out loud as, as I think about your questions. I mean, I think that guideposts of my life are friendships, trust, love, um, patience, presence, listening in the sense of wonder, you know, just just being present and trying to be in the moment and, and um, being still, you know, not trying to, to walk through life rather than react to life. Um, and it's funny, what a blessing to say, I'm sitting here thinking like, what setbacks have I had recently? And I don't know that I've had, I mean, thank God, I don't know that I've had, well, I will better said, I don't know that I've had a lot of what I would consider setbacks. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly not recently. Um, I think something else that gets me through when I've had setbacks or when things don't go the way I want exactly, you know, just to remember that everything's an opportunity to learn. You know, it, there's a lot of cliches are true for a reason. You know, you, you don't learn from success, you learn from failure. There's a lot of truth in that. I think one thing that's so special about being in a, what, what for me is a great marriage and, and to have great friends are people who just love you enough to be really brutally honest with you. I mean, I, I, I <laughs> my husband, John is his name is, is truly like my greatest teacher and my greatest cheerleader and fan. And that's a beautiful thing when you have that, because, you know, when there are setbacks, it's, you know, he and my friends are there to comfort me, but also to hold me accountable and say, well, okay, what role did you, if any, did you play in that? What can you learn from it? And how can you grow from that? And how can you be an example to our son about that? And how, you know, so, um, maybe that's why I don't consider that I've had a lot of setbacks because I, because I guess maybe thanks to him and friends, we turn them pretty quickly into, well, that's life, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, what are you going to do about it? Um, but also I think, you know, I think I've been lucky and I think I work hard and, and I think, uh, it's funny when you said reaching out, not up, it's uh, this, these words aren't right. I don't have low expectations for myself <laughs> professionally. It's not that. It's that I really, maybe I don't have setbacks as I perceive, maybe I don't perceive things as setbacks because I really just wake up and do every day what I love to do and to serve other people. 
and to do the best I can. And so when those are your goals, whether I have, you know, like however many people are in the masterclass or however many people read the article or however many people buy the book or however many people email me and say, thank you. I mean, when, when those are my intentions for the day, I mean, what kind of setbacks can you have? Mm-hmm. So maybe again, I'm thank you for your patience. I'm thinking out loud. Um, I think if I, I think if I walked into my days, like I want to write X pages and have this many followers or that kind of thing for me personally, I think I would perceive more setbacks. And I think my, I wouldn't be as happy and as creative. Um, Mm -hmm. And I I just, I love, I love what I do and I love doing what I do and I'm less concerned about the other stuff. And interestingly, the less concerned I am about it, it it seems to take care of itself. Yeah. Yeah. As much as it needs to, right. Yeah. Or as much as it does. Right. Yeah. And by the way, I want to be clear for, for your listeners and, to be really transparent. I mean, I, I don't have anything against like people who are like, I want to have a million followers, or I think that's wonderful. I think we're all motivated by different things. And I'm in no way saying wrong to have that. I just know that my skill set, my strengths, my passion and my interest, um, it's not those things. And when I've have tried to sort of play those games, I get more anxious and it pulls me out of that, like loving, trusting, creative, doing the best I can with whatever client or group or reader I'm working with. Mm-hmm. So, you know, at, at, in my middle, my mid forties right now, I just have thought I'm very happy just with where I am and how I've chosen to done it, to have chosen to do it. And I've done it and chosen to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that might change tomorrow, but that's where I am right now. Mm-hmm. We're, we're yeah. No, that's great. I, I think that's very clear. Uh, it reminds me of when I was a humanitarian volunteer in Brazil, mm-hmm. my perspective became very humble. And also, I, I, I don't say humble as like a credit to myself, just like naturally. Yeah, yeah I know. Because I was really dependent on, uh, on just getting c- clean water to drink was a really big deal. Water was the most important thing. Okay. And relationships with the neighbors, we, we were kind of in the middle of nowhere in a very dry area of Brazil. And, uh, like when you talk about numbers and like social media numbers and how we can get caught up with that and it gets, we can be anxious from it, which has happened to me, certainly. Um, when I was there, I remember how rich a day was. You're like, first of all, there's no internet connection in the village. Awesome. This was 2010, but you know, and I had no cell phone with me. So I was disconnected for five days when I was at it. Not, I went to, to town the weekend. So I had two days to potentially connect with very bare basic internet this is like the the poorest town in all of the state of bahia brazil wow. but we lived in a village outside of that town so i mean like a lot of bugs in the house we slept in mosquito nets um there was uh yeah <laughs> but the kids running around barefoot the, the fa- family had to choose between buying them a blank notebook or buying them sneakers you know that type of thing <clears throat> we're very happy people they're out playing their guitar not too many, if they only like three guitars in the village, they would go knock on the guy's door, like, can I use your guitar, you know? And they would sing and wouldn't have to be tuned too well. It was relatively in tune, that was enough, you know? Uh, and just like, if I could, if I had three or four students that would show up to my guitar class, um, that would pay attention to me. If I had one or two private students or some people I could teach English to, you know, you know the phrase, if time and money weren't an obstacle, what would you do, right? Yeah. In that case, they weren't an obstacle really because we had just what we need to get by. You didn't need too much money because the, it just wasn't necessary. You know, you ha- we have, we're gonna get food, we had the shelter, that's all, right? And uh, so if, when you take away time, money, we don't feel like we have to do this to get money. We don't have to do such and such to like survive. And we just go like by, to our natural condition, like, okay, my survival is taken care of. What do I want to do? Then it's like you said, just if I communicate with three, four or five people and have a heart to heart exchange and teach them something, they teach me something, they help me get water or whatever. That's very rich life. Yeah. You know, especially when there's no, you can't text, you can't do the other stuff. It's just not an option. Yeah. And then just, you spend time, you look at the beautiful sky and the huge mountains in the distance. Yeah. <clears throat> that was very rich. I didn't feel that the people in, uh, cities or something or, or richer countries were uh, had it better. 
but I, I did, I, I, I was a struggle for other reasons, but at the same time, I felt like very fulfilled on a soul level. Yeah. That's beautiful. <clears throat> yeah. And again, no. back to technology, I mean, it's designed to get us feeling a sense of lack so that we return to it again and again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in its absence, it's, you, you kind of get back to like, oh, wow. Yeah. There's the four hour best television show called the sunset, you know, <laughs> the, Right. Simple pleasures that are better than any, you know, app or game or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's so amazing. And I, I get a little bit bummed out, not to take a sour turn, but how much I'm dependent on my, my computer. Mm -hmm. I really want to do work without it. So like if my son wants to watch something and I want to work. Yeah. I'm like, because we share the computer. I'm like, what can I do without it? You know, cause everything's going to go, I could write it on paper, but I have to type it in later, you know? So it's like, ah, but uh, you know, I find other ways to get creative. I just take my, what I have to, what I tend to do is I just take my laptop outside. If I have to be on it. I'm going to be in nature. Yeah. That, that's what I, yeah, I, I have nature by me, fortunately, but uh, that's why I love the garage. So I, I don't get a signal back there. Yeah. So my, my wifi is off my uh, Bluetooth's off. It's just yeah. a bare computer, whatever's on the machine, that's all you're going to get, you know, awesome. and whatever on my cassette tape deck. <laughs> <laughs> Def Leppard. <laughs> yeah, right. Which I have a lot of Def Leppard tapes out there. That's awesome. Um, how has your tastes and perspectives relating to music shifted and evolved over the years? Must, yeah, I imagine you must have thought one way about music as a kid, another as a young adult, and then a performer, and now... You, you have a more of a therapeutic view, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I hadn't thought about your question until you asked it. Um, you know, the, I will, I, the, the thing that comes to my mind, which is not a great answer to your question, but I think it's the most uh, maybe profound for me is that, you know, for me, again, music has just always been a gift and I, I love all kinds of music. I go through phases with people like artists. I'll just become obsessed like with Brandy Carlisle or when I was younger, the Indigo Girls or, um, you know, just Kim Burrell for a while. I mean, just whomever, Sting, whatever phase I went through where I just love. But again, it was, it was something in their voice, the honesty, the transparency. Um, but I think the, the biggest shift that ever occurred for me about music was when I was in college and I write about this in my first book, so as I said, I always had this very organic relationship with singing and, and music. And then when I went to college and I trained classically as a singer, which at the time, most universities and colleges, you, you didn't have a choice, you just trained classically. They kind of encouraged into us like, a, and I mean, I, I wanna, I'm not trying to blame them, but it's sort of a known thing. You're sort of trained into an arrogance of like, you know, we're, we're great singers and those people aren't great singers and come, you know, pop singers aren't great singers, opera singers, are great. there's like this whole thing. It's kind of in the water. Even if you, nobody says it to you, you have that. Yeah. I remember being midway through school and just like hanging with some friends, like, Oh, did you hear her sing that? Did you hear him sing that? And I was, I just heard myself. I remember who it was too. It was, it was at the time Jewel was an artist, you know, a big artist and everyone was just ripping on her voice. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, like, how far have I fallen? Like, I used to listen to and love everyone and think I could learn something from everyone. And who have I become? And what is, is this what classical training is? This is, forget this. And I remember I changed teachers and I got someone who was, you know, uh, there's more of the story, but um, who wasn't considered a great teacher or a great singer, but she loved music. And I just lo loved working with her. And I so that was in my life, the biggest shift I had in my relationship with music. It was the only time I think I was ever arrogant about music and condescending about music and judgmental about singers and therefore, you know, not uh, appreciating music the way mm -hmm. that I, I always had and always have since. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then after your performance career, then you come into the therapeutic uh, psychological side of it and did, did you view a music change then since you weren't singing so much or are you still singing every day at home oh I sing all the time yeah <laughs> my singing clients I sing and I I, I sing non-stop um, around the house for sure 
No, I, I know I don't know that my view of music has changed. If, if I'm not understanding your question, please feel free to rephrase it. But no, I mean, I think, no, I mean, I, I love it. I think it's a gift. I think it's certainly the way I reach most deeply into myself and pull out, you know, and expose my heart in a way that I, I don't get from running or yoga or, well, I, I love to dance. So I have a similar thing with dancing, but I know there's something about singing that just, woof, it's, no, it's been a through theme of my life. So no matter what I do with my days, if it's writing or counseling or, or, or coaching, it's like music is still right there. And yeah, no, my, it's been sort of a consistent, the longest, most consistent relationship I've had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, yeah. You, you mentioned the love affair with music and my guitar would, would definitely be that for me. Yeah. Uh, one of the books I have in the future, I've started it. It's just not rip time, but it's called uh, A Guitar Life. Oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah which is be more like a memoir style. Um, just snippets of how the guitar took me on this journey. You know, it's very special and unique journey. Um, yeah, and uh, just just to, yeah, so you answered the question wonderfully. Thank you. It, and there's, you definitely understood it. It's just you, it didn't change for you, perhaps, in, in, in the way you see it. So. Uh, for me, it did change a lot. So I'm trying to get back to that purity of, of it more and more. Yeah. Uh, but I definitely went through that arrogant phase for different reasons, more like being a metalhead. There was a certain mm -hmm. uh, arrogance or I don't know what else you would call clickishness to that. And then, yeah. uh, then I went to conservatory music too. So I, I had a little bit of that. Like I'm, I know more about music than all my friends. So yeah, exactly. You know, and, and then that wasn't any good. And, uh, but then, then it really the main shift that I had over the years is just recognizing, which I knew when I started listening to heavy metal and stuff that uh, this is probably not the best music because I know I can't play it for my grandma and my mom. They're not going to like the curses or whatever, or the energy I tried, they didn't like it. And, you know, just have recognizing, which is the, what my book, mind your music is about recognizing the, the toxic elements in it and peeling myself away from that and realizing I can't teach that. Yeah. And I have to find, that's why part of the reason I developed my own method and, and shifted my music so much and not wanting to be in a musical career because in the vein that I was going in, it really didn't seem healthy. Mm -hmm. So to realize that I could still incorporate the music I love, but with, you know, with um, discernment and then some music I would really just have to cut out of my life. Yeah. Um, so it did change for me in that respect. And I guess that's part of the reason I would ask, I asked that question, but yeah, everyone's journey is different. Yeah. Um, so do you have a spiritual philosophy that guides or informs what you do and how you live? Uh, you're asking, you're asking such great questions. I feel like we should do a part two. Um, yeah, it's getting late. I don't want to keep it. We have, uh, they don't, there's such great questions. I want to answer them richly. Um, you know, it's funny when you talked about your journey. I mean, I wasn't raised anything in particular. And I went through, it sounds like a similar phase where I tried on different religions. Um, no, I mean, I, I, again, language can be tricky. I, I think that, I guess I could be considered a pantheist. You know, I, I don't know the answers. I'm okay not knowing the answers. I think that I really am in alignment with Joseph Campbell. I don't know if you're familiar with him before he passed away. Um, you know, that the religion is man's or human beings um, attempt to understand a great mystery. And I'm content with it being a great mystery. And I, I consider my spirituality, if, if you can describe it in language, is just kind of a constant ongoing reverence for the unknown and wonder at every moment. And, and I really believe that there's um, bliss and enlightenment everywhere around us and everything and every relationship and every moment, if we are willing and have eyes and the discipline to see it. And not that we can in every moment, but I mean, I just think that there's so much beauty in nature and in people and, and that wonder is what really guides us there rather than any right answer, you know, specific philosophy. I, I, I don't personally believe that that I or we, but certainly I can um, know, you know, the, the what, how, why we're here. And I'm totally <laughs> fine with that. I, I, I love dwelling in the, 
not the question like to get an answer, but just the question of like, wow, the wowness of it, you know, like, I mean, look, you just lie on your back and at night, look at the stars, like, wow, but you know, isn't that enough? <laughs> what, 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 what other religion do you need? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's great. Yeah. That, that reminds me of like this concept of, um, which pretty much what you said, but focusing rather on the, the right question or the answer to the question, just focusing on asking good questions that are open-ended. Yeah. Like you could say why and be, be content to never, to not even expect or even hope for an answer, but just to let the why float out there or, 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 or a better question than why, you know? Yeah, for sure. And just sit with that and the mystery of that, you know, why, who says we need, I guess you could even say the, the concept of having to have an answer. Where does that come from? You know, why, why do we think that an answer is necessary or, or know? even, even the questions or even, the, <laughs> right. Even the questions. Language. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I do, um, I've done in the past and I recommended to people doing, um, you know, a silence for a week if they can get away with it, which is hard with life and kids, but certainly for a day or two, a weekend, if you can do it. It's amazing when you, when you stop talking, um, just what happens to your brain and what happens to you, you know, the, when you just kind of are quiet, you, you're not reaching for language to describe and to label and to judge. And the, um, yeah, I think that language, like, like everything is a tool that we sort of wield unwittingly uh without recognizing the consequences uh, mm. yeah and certainly true with needing answers needing questions you know needing words mm. needing labels all that for sure yeah like uh so like a talking uh speech fest or something right yeah They're yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I've had i've heard a few people talk about that do that and i've never tried it. even have you done a week i have yeah I mean, yeah. Well, one time, the first time I did it, I was forced to because I was in college and I uh, sang way too hard on a sick throat and I had a performance in uh, in about a week and a half's time. No, it was two weeks, actually. Forgive me. I couldn't talk for two weeks. Not a word, <laughs> not a cough, nothing. And it was hell the first couple of days and I was running around with a notebook and pen. And then about a couple of days in, Pat, later, I was like totally kind of zen out and by the end I was like this is bliss <laughs> observing wonder filled being curious it was heaven heaven oh, man. <laughs> so then that was so amazing that later I would do a week I think I did it three or four times a single week after that one time but that was before I had a husband and a kid you know I, I could take a week and do it mm -hmm. yeah I'll get back to it though. Yeah, it sounds cool. Yeah, I know. I never had anyone describe it to me so, like, uh, in, 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 enticingly. You know. <laughs> yeah, when I started talking, and I was like, "This is overrated." <laughs> but yeah, anyway. I can imagine. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll so I'll kind of like do some quick ending questions so we can get you off to bed because I know you probably want to <laughs> yeah, get to sleep totally soon. Totally fast <laughs> but no, yeah, hit me. Um, so yeah slice through them as quick as you want. Um, so I think this might be a long one. So if you want to pass and we'll pass, uh, are there any setbacks you feel comfortable to share in which music has helped you to pull through? I know you said no setbacks recently. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't want to pass on any of your questions, but, um, for the sake of time, let's, let's come back to that one. Cause I think that would be, uh, I have to think that through and, and, and come up with a long answer probably. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Um, so can you share up to three inspiring books, films, or shows that you'd like to recommend to our listeners, especially maybe people are feeling a little down the past year. I mean, maybe hopefully feeling better now since things are a little light, lighter these days, but you know, after the whole COVID experience, something uplifting that you could, or inspiring. Yeah. Well, off the top, you know, my go-tos. So the music lesson by Victor Wooten, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I mentioned Mary Oliver, poet, and her book, uh, Devotions, which is a collection of some of her greatest um, or best-known poems. It's fantastic. I love, um, I love Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now. Um, I love Don Miguel Ruiz's uh, The Four Agreements. Mm -hmm. um, just thinking of uplifting. Um, you know, I think Hamilton is one of the greatest Broadway shows I've ever seen, which of course now, as you can see, is a movie incredible. Mm -hmm. um, 
no matter your, you know, your preferred genre of music, just the fact that this one man wrote, orchestrated and performed the lead in this show and just, just, just incredible, just a, an assault of the senses in such a great way. Um, gosh, I haven't seen a movie in so long. <laughs> I don't know. Well, and I never saw the movie Hamilton. I just saw the show, but, um, but yeah, I think off the top, that's what I'd say. Um, oh, uh, one more that is, you know, you're Buddhist. I, I'm not really anything, but I, I read the Tao Te Ching, not, maybe not daily, but often. Um, Rumi's poetry, um, Jorge Luis Borges's poetry, um, Hafiz, the Persian um, mm -hmm. poet from, you know, I think the 13th century. A guy named Daniel Andinsky did a great translation of his poetry that's very spiritual and very beautiful. Um, so off the top, those are some that I think are inspiring to your point and certainly warm my heart and sort of bring me back to my, to my center. Um, cool. Who, who, who translated the Hafiz? Hafez, oh, one uh, that you like? Well, the one I like, and not that it's the best, it's just the one I've got to know is a guy named Daniel Daniel Landinsky. And, okay. Yeah. And he has many collections, but one I love is, um, what's the name of it? It's called I Heard God Laughing. And I mean, just amazing. That one's a great, that's such a great, you could literally open any page and just be like, wow. For me, just really, right. great. yeah. Uh, and so the second, I think I missed the second book. Um, Cause I'll put these in the show notes for people oh, okay. to reference. Oh, uh, Victor Wooten, the, then before Power of Now, you said something, I don't know, a woman or something. Oh, Mary Oliver. Okay. Poet, and she has many collections, but the book Devotions is a collection of her, best of her collections. Mm -hmm. So Devotions by Mary Oliver, just amazing. Like on my bedside table read every morning kind of thing open to any page okay cool yeah cool and, and the Tao Te Ching any particular version there's probably so many yeah that I don't know enough about um I, I just have a couple different copies around the house um mm -hmm. no I'm not I don't know enough about like would, there probably are some best translations I don't know but I just mm -hmm. love All right. them. just just curious and Rumi just in general any anything by Rumi <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool no that's good uh, some some of these are overlap from other people because some of these are common like power of now and yeah. but uh and some of these you know no one ever mentioned uh hamilton or oh, yeah yeah or or Rumi or even tao Te ching um yeah. thank you so if you'd like to share what are you doing the next couple of months well let's see i'm working on another book so um, all, the summer's really been sort of kind of family time. I've been taking a little bit of a break from the book, lots of articles, lots of masterclasses. Um, but yeah, the next book is sort of my, my next kind of big gearing back up after we, after the beach and the pool, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pun intended dive back into that. <laughs> and <laughs> will it be a, a singing, a similar vein, uh, art of singing type of thing? Like you, I have like three or four on the kind of irons in the fire. The, the one that I'm working on right now is the, the they've all been about the psychology of singing, different things. This is really more of sort of the spirituality of singing in my view, my experience of how trust and love and vulnerability is as important in singing and as it is in life and sort of, a, yeah, I mean, it's still, I'm still working on it, but just like my first book, I would get all these questions about technique. Now I get so many questions about uh, that eye roll was not because I mind the questions is just so heartbreaking. There's so many of them about how do I find joy in it? How do I find peace in it? How do I find comfort in it? You know, and I feel so anxious about it or insecure about it. And so this is my answer to that, you know? Hmm. Okay, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh... Yeah, I do. I, as a guitar teacher, and I, I've been a vocal teacher too. I never got vocal lessons really, but I've taught people to sing because oh, wow, okay. naturally, you know, people play guitar, want to sing. Yeah. I would always, my, my approach, I, I only can teach certain types of people, I guess, people gravitate towards me and who maybe can't sing in tune so well or self-conscious. My philosophy is just like, when I started singing, my mom and brother didn't like it. They tell me I was dying cat or whatever, you know, it's just 
and I hear my old recordings. I hear how out of tune I was or over overly excited or whatever. And so my philosophy is just same with, with guitar, just enjoy it. Yeah. Cause it's a gift that we each have to just enjoy music. And when you start go from that pure space, like you're in the forest, there's no one else here. You got to amuse yourself. No one else is coming for a week. What are you going to do? You know, and you just learn how to enjoy experience. There's no in tune attitude. What does it even mean? You know? So just like express, enjoy that just feeling. Mm-hmm. And I have a few people who really continue to sing, even though they never became like what's, you know, considered a good singer. Yeah. They found the joy and it was able to enjoy it. And despite that, you know, that's beautiful. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and so finally, last but not least, I hate to end this, but I do feel uh, sympathy for your uh, tired <laughs> tiredness. Cause I know what it feels like. No, I'm very yeah. happy. Forgive me. It's, I am that kind of, I'm lame that way. My friends are like, you go to bed at what time? I'm like, I don't know. By nine o'clock, I'm cutting toast. I'm lame that way. But go ahead, please. No, I, believe me, I, I hope I aspire to get there one day. I guess I'd rarely get up at 5 a.m. But I, I just tend to go to bed later. And I got up at 7. Uh, no, yeah, close to, what was it? Yeah, 6.30 today. And I was disappointed because I want to get up at 5.30, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, um, I won't be too hard on myself. Don't. So yeah. where can people find you and learn more about what you have to offer? And I'll, I'll put links in the notes. Yeah, my website's uh, findingyourvoice.com and links to everything are there. So books, articles, working with me, masterclasses, intensives, all that stuff, findingyourvoice.com. Cool. And so you're still available to work with new clients and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. All my right. model in life is say yes to everything. The answer's up <laughs> All right. Wow. So it's been really fun, Jennifer Hamady. Yeah. Uh, it's been my pleasure. And uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you. Truly, this is such a great night. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I will put uh, this up on YouTube. I'll send you the links and you could use it as you see fit or whatever, or just have it there to listen to 10 years from now to see where you were <laughs> in 2021. I'm happy to share. It's been my honor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right jennifer until next time have right. a wonderful night thank you so much take care yeah thank you have a good night bye